Hey everybody, it's Jason Blaha here and it's time for part two of the Q&A, so let me get my hat on. Work on my crafting a little bit and let's get to this first question. All right. Uh, how much sugar a day can we consume without getting diabetes <laughs> and does exercise, water, and healthy eating allow us to consume more sugar uh, or does it just help prevent it? Thanks. All right. As far as your latter question goes, uh, does exercise, training, cardiovascular conditioning, weightlifting allow you to consume more sugar uh, without the negative effects? Probably, to some extent. How much? We don't actually know. We don't actually know. Now, that being said, when we talk about sugar, we need to drop this term sugar because that's not what we're talking about. Uh, no one out there who's talking about diabetes, who's talking about insulin resistance or whatever is talking about sugar, the general medical term or nutritional term sugar. And if you were to say, oh, well, they mean table sugar, but that's only one of the, one of the sources. We're talking specifically about fructose. There is no need to track your sugar intake uh, based upon sugar grams. You need to know how much fructose you're consuming. If you want to know how much fructose is in any given sugar source, you're going to have to look it up yourself. But I can tell you table sugar is 50% fructose by gram. And high fructose corn syrup is 55% fructose by gram. So 20 grams of table sugar has 10 grams of fructose. 20 grams of high fructose corn syrup has 11. Following me now? All right, what we know is that we have found in studies, and by we, I mean the human race scientific communities. I don't mean that me personally or my channel has conducted studies since people freak out when I say the word we, as in we, the human race, have accumulated a body of knowledge that anyone with access to uh, study databases can read for themselves. Now, what we know at this point is that there is a strong, enormously strong correlation between consuming at least 50 grams of fructose a day chronically and diabetes, insulin resistance, uh, metabolic syndrome, and fatty liver. Uh, that seems to be right at the threshold to where it becomes a problem. Is it to say that fructose at lower doses is a problem? Probably not. Probably not. You've got to remember, it's a toxin that negatively affects the liver. Uh, it has some problems in the body, but like any other toxin, you can handle it in moderation. The problem is that people don't know what the word moderation means. And in this case, moderation means less than 50 grams a day. If you're exceeding that, you are uh, subjecting yourself to a dangerous amount. Lifting weights and exercise may not help you because the issue is not about burning the calories off. That's one factor. That's one factor, but when we're talking about actual insulin resistance and fatty liver, lifting weights doesn't make your liver bigger and stronger. Exercising doesn't make your liver bigger and stronger. Your liver is an organ, and your liver has a finite limit of what it can do. Uh, as far as filtering toxins out, how much stuff it can handle. So exercise isn't going to prevent those things, probably isn't. Could it in theory help? Maybe. We don't have hard data showing it though. So just because you work out doesn't mean, oh, I can eat double that amount and not suffer any problems. You won't suffer some of the insulin resistance problems. But the fatty liver end, the liver toxicity end, uh, all of that, yeah, you're going to suffer that. It's just your muscle tissue might retain better insulin sensitivity from all the exercise. But there's a big difference between the two. So you got to look at it from that perspective. And what we do know is that uh, exercise does offset some of the other negative health effects, the other things that go around it. Because what we know is that people who are sedentary and obese, that the chronic fructose intake exacerbates all of those problems. It makes all the health problems around those things worse. It makes them worse. And what people need to understand also, it, it piles in with other lifestyle factors. If you consume other things that are toxic to the liver, uh, that number goes down, meaning your alcohol consumption, your pill consumption, things like that, uh, just starts driving that number down of what your liver can handle because it's got to filter those toxins as well at that point. Uh, so just food for thought there. All right, uh, next question. Jason, regarding protein intake, you said the sweet spot to gain muscle is 1 gram to 1.5 grams per kilogram of body weight. It's 1 to 1.6, not 1.5. Uh, doing full body routine three times a week, basically we keep the muscle protein synthesis high all days. But what if we don't train for, let's say, a week? Or <laughs> if we train uh, two times a week? Those days when the muscle protein synthesis is not high, the amount of ingested protein can drop a bit. If we ingest the same amount, would it be a little of waste or we lose something of our protein intake? 
Let's see. He says, hope I made it clear. My English is not the best. Thanks. All right. Uh, you're under some assumption that you're converting significant amounts of protein you eat into muscle. You're not. Uh, as I've said when I discussed these things in the past, you are in the best case scenario, best case scenario, converting three or four grams of protein a day into muscle that you eat. So here's, here's what you could do different. Let's assume that your range... <laughs> Uh, based on your body weight that I just gave you is something like 80 to 120 grams of protein a day. Well, that means you could probably get away with 80 or maybe even go 200 because you're probably only storing 2 grams of protein as muscle a day anyways. You could maybe drop to 78 instead of 80. Uh, this is, it's really tit for tat with stuff like this. And I know people have these ideas in their head that they're converting very large amounts of protein that they consume into to muscle tissue that man, may 20 or 30 or 50 grams of the protein you eat a day is in some way going towards building muscle. It's not. Uh, and, and that's provable. That, in fact, all you guys need to do is look at the amount of pro do some basic math, all right? Uh, assuming even a decent conversion rate, there's no more than 120 grams of protein in a pound of muscle tissue. So to build a pound of muscle a month, how much extra protein do you need to eat above your basic needs for health and, and recovery and everything? Do the math. 120 at the most divided by 30 days. That's four grams. That's not a lot, guys. And even if you say, well, the body's inefficient, it might take twice that. Well, that's eight grams. It means what, you get away with eating eight less grams of protein? Does anyone really track their protein that close? I promise you, you probably can't even track your protein within five to 10 grams of what you consume every day. You can get it in the ballpark, but you can't even measure it that close. That's why anyone who's smart gives you ranges on things, they don't give you exact numbers. Uh, because exact numbers are useless because you don't have the technology and the means available to you to track exact numbers. You don't know exactly how many grams of protein or carbs or fat you ate a day. Uh, a digital scale can't tell you that. You would actually need to send every single meal that you eat off to a lab or a sample of it to even find out. And then you didn't eat it. You see the problem? Uh, you can't track it that closely, so you don't know. So really, guys, this is stuff of, of paralysis through analysis uh, is a term. This is not helpful for you in any way to know this. So you're going to try to consume four less grams of protein a day uh, on, on days when you don't think your muscles are going to grow? Come on. Uh, you can't even measure four grams of protein difference in your day-to-day your -day diet with a digital scale. Uh, so you're not going to be able to pull that off. Um, all right, next question. Howdy, Jason. Can you talk about vertical versus horizontal pressing, specifically if it's safe to omit one type? I love vertical presses, such as the push press, but hate horizontal presses, such as the bench press and dips. Is it safe for me to exclusively use the push press as my pressing movement, or should I throw in bench press or dips to avoid muscular imbalances? Uh, kind of like I answered on that other similar question, uh, what do you seek to gain from it? Like, what is it that you seek to gain by completely removing uh, chest presses from your routine? Now, I can understand that someone says, I don't care that much about having fully developed lower pecs. I don't need them to be massive, I just need them to be functional. I just need to be strong. Yeah, you could probably do the push press. You could probably do the push press and be fine. Um, however, if you're seeking any sort of real muscle balance, you probably do need to do both. But uh, I can understand it if you don't care that much about having enormous bulging pecs that match your shoulders and arms, if that's not really on your priority list for whatever reason. Some dudes don't even like man boobies. They don't like having big pecs. Believe it or not, there are guys who don't like that. They think it looks feminine to them and they don't want big massive pecs. They look like titties to them. I've met dudes who feel that way. That they think it's feminine. That if you got big pecs, you look like a bitch. I've heard dudes say that. So, uh, if that's the case, you can de-emphasize something. You can come in, like I said in the other question, you could come in and do one set of dips once a week just to train the motor pattern, to train the movement pattern, to get some lower pec stimulation and put all your other focus on the push press for your pressing power. Because that's where your priorities are. You want that for the explosive power, the full body strength pushed into a press uh, because you want it for the performance elements. You want it for the strength and the power that it yields. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's totally acceptable. But it doesn't mean that you have to completely negate another performance element and a normal range of motion 
uh, that you don't have to completely remove it from your routine to de-emphasize it because it's not that important to you. Uh, you know, because this stuff is about priorities. It is about prioritizing your training. But, you know, that's a case to where you're not gaining anything uh, by doing so. You're not gaining anything by completely removing it. Uh, and, you know, again, it takes one minute out of your week to, to drop by and do a set of dips on your way out the door. Just to give you a little bit of pectoral development uh, for the lower pecs without them getting uh, excessive. Because, again, I understand that. But in the bodybuilding world we watch online, they don't get that. They don't understand that there are plenty of guys who work out who don't want big pecs. They don't like the look. Uh, they think it looks feminine, and that's that's their perception. That's their right to think so. It's not your place to judge how someone perceives their own body and what they want or don't want out of it. Um, that's their own call to make. So I can understand that, but you could just de-emphasize it. Problem solved. All right, next question. In a previous video, you mentioned that regardless of composition, that 300 pounds is terrible for health and that being a super heavyweight strength athlete is inherently unhealthy. Uh, how much harm can be reduced for a super heavyweight by adding cardio, such as doing one hour of list daily minimum? Uh, is there any other things that can help mitigate the risk? I've heard some strongmen have prescription blood pressure meds, and it also seems just about all of them own a CPAP machine. Yeah, let's talk about that. All right, guys. If you're 300 pounds, it's inherently unhealthy. I don't give a fuck if you're Ronnie Coleman. I don't give a fuck if you're Eddie Hall. I don't care. You're fucking unhealthy if you're 300 pounds. That is reality. Now, is it better to be 300 pounds at 12% body fat instead of 300 pounds at 50% body fat? Yes, it is healthier. Will a CPAP machine and doing lots of cardio and taking blood pressure meds offset some of the negative effects? Yes. But that's the thing. He's asking, we'll, we'll offset the negative health effects. Well, you listed them, brother. You listed them yourself right there. Do you think these guys come up with this stuff on their own? No, their doctors are giving them this. Uh, but what you need to understand is that if you decide to be 300 pounds, even if you're 300 pounds of muscle, you are choosing the muscle over your health and longevity. That's a conscious choice you're making. And that's okay. It's your body. you got to do what makes you happy. All right, and if that's what makes you happy and makes your life be fulfilled and it cuts 20 years off your life, well, who the fuck is anybody else to tell you what to do? Don't call it fitness, though. Don't call it health. As long as you don't do that and you don't promote it as a healthy lifestyle, then that's okay. That's fine because you're making yourself happy. You're making your life fulfilled and fuck anybody who tells you otherwise. But you need to make it clear that you're not healthy. You don't be telling other people that if you choose to do that, that you're the pinnacle of health. I mean, when you need a fucking CPAP machine and blood pressure meds uh, so that you don't die, that's not health, but that's okay. But that's how you mitigate it. Yeah, guys, do cardio every day. Uh, get your CPAP machine, take blood pressure meds your doctor gives you. It will help keep you alive longer. That will offset the negative effects. That, that's pretty much it. Maybe eat less fat in your diet because some of that saturated fat out. A lot of these guys eat probably too many bacon cheeseburgers. I know because I know a lot of these guys. Known them over the years. Cut some of the saturated fat and salt out of your diet a little bit. Do your cardio and uh, use your CPAP. It'll add another 10 years to your life. Uh, you're still going to die younger, but hey, it'll keep you around longer. All right, next question. Hey Jason, last week you answered my question about whether or not it's possible to do more frequent workouts than three per week for muscle growth. Um, you agreed and said that it was possible to train four times, uh, yet five times will only allow for more motor pattern learning but not muscle gains. Uh, why that's the case if there are workout plans that have like five plus sets for optimal growth yet doing five sets a week in separate days doesn't work. I could have understood that it was due to the fact that you blah blah blah. Okay. Let me explain how that works. It's because most people are doing a decent amount of workload every, every workout. Uh, and the motor pattern learning was about doing training matches. We were talking about Bulgarian training every day where you're hitting training matches to train motor patterns. People who are doing true, any sort of hypertrophy training or decent training volume, meaning you're doing 25 to 30 reps in a workout, yeah, you probably won't gain muscle by training more than three times a week from doing that. If you're coming in and doing only one set, like you're talking about doing a, a 
five sets of 10 spread out over five days, yeah, you'll gain extra muscle by doing the fourth and fifth day. You will gain more muscle because your muscle protein synthesis up time is gonna be a little lower. Uh, your total protein turnover is gonna be lower due to the really low volume. So you could get away with a higher frequency, but you need to understand that when you're doing that, you're not gaining more muscle due to the frequency, you're gaining more muscle due to the volume. All right, and, and we need to make that point clear. Because if you had done the same volume packed into three days instead of five, you would have gained just as much muscle. So, so that's what you need to understand. And that case is because you're dropping the volume so low that you actually are getting enough weekly tonnage to add additional growth by training the fifth day in that case. Uh, but for people, we're talking about people who are doing multiple sets, maybe even doing multiple exercises per body part. No, they're not going to see more muscle growth from training a muscle group more than three times a week. Probably not. Um, maybe in some cases with little feeder workouts to keep muscle protein synthesis up or trigger workouts depending on whose terms you use uh, where you get the term online okay there can be something to that but as far as actual serious workouts no training a muscle more than three times a week uh, from actual serious workouts probably unlikely to give you any additional muscle growth but when you're cutting down to, to one set two sets of workout yeah you you can possibly get more from going beyond that uh, and that's a, the distinction that we need to draw there all right, guys, but that's really all I have to say on that today. I hope it's been informative, and I will talk to you guys next time in part three.